I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 166th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing betterment of your brain by any and all means at your disposal. This week, we're going to be talking about something with a scary name, arachidonic acid, which is a fatty acid used by your brain and body and something which actually gets demonized quite a bit. It can be found in fatty animal tissue, something which a lot of people are afraid to have too much of in their diets. But as we will hear, this is something very much subject to the Goldilocks principle, where too little can be just as bad as too much. We'll be talking about arachidonic acid, its precursors, omega-3s and omega-6s, and the physiological balancing act between those two, and if really a balancing act is even necessary. Going to be speaking with an expert on dietary fats by the name of Dr. Chris Masterjohn, so stay tuned for that in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, I'm going to tell you about a collar, not a late night phone collar, but one of those things that goes around your neck if you're wearing a shirt that could have a tie, a collar that might actually be able to minimize the effects of concussion. Sounds weird, is a little weird, but that's why we're saving it for the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, because that's where we talk about the weirdest stuff. But for right now, let's kick things off as usual with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, this week in neuroscience. So given all the physiological changes that happen in women when they are pregnant, it should probably be no surprise that there are big changes to a woman's brain as well. And this is something that we've sort of known anecdotally forever. Women talk about baby brains sometimes getting more forgetful during or following a pregnancy and, of course, craving certain foods. All these things are kind of well known and have got to be neurological in nature. But surprisingly, there hasn't been all that much study into exactly what goes on within a woman's brain while she's pregnant. Maybe just because there's so many other things that could also be studied during pregnancy the brain hasn't been on the top of researchers' lists. But a recent study conducted at Leiden University in the Netherlands is seeking to correct that. They wanted to look at the brains of women who are having their first pregnancy, so both new mothers and first-time mothers, versus a control group following them before, during, and after their pregnancy, and actually doing a follow-up two years later to see if these brain changes stuck around. So here's how the study worked. They scanned the brains of 25 women who were first-time mothers. They also scanned the brains of 19 first-time fathers at the same intervals, and 17 men without children, and also 20 women who did not have children, and who did not become pregnant during the study. Then they used computer-based analyses to look at the changes in gray matter volume in those people during that time. The only group in that study that showed a high and consistent degree of changes in the brain's gray matter were the first-time mothers, not the first-time fathers, not the women who didn't give birth to children. And what they found was a highly consistent loss in the gray matter volume in those mothers. Now, losing gray matter doesn't sound like a good thing, and this is a major caveat that the researchers sought to underscore as they're explaining this to the press, that we should not take this at face value. Losing is not always bad. If you're losing extra weight from a race car, the car can go faster because it's not hauling as much weight around. And there are many neurodevelopmental processes where pruning the brain, the brain gets more efficient by having less connections, less active pathways, and in some cases, even less neurons. The areas where these losses in gray matter occurred were primarily devoted to social tasks like reading the desires and intentions of others from their faces and actions. So if this hypothesis is right, that what's going on here is an intentional pruning based on making the brain more efficient, it could be that the mother's brain is becoming fine-tuned to read the emotions of her new child. There was also significant loss in the hippocampus, a brain region associated with memory. This could have a lot to do with the anecdotal reports of worse memory by many women. But here's what's really interesting. The women who showed the most significant changes in their gray matter were also the women that showed the strongest neurological activity related to interactions with their own baby versus those of other babies, which kind of supports this pruning hypothesis. That the mothers with the greatest changes seemed most fine-tuned towards their own infants, or at least most interested in their own infants versus infants from another woman. So of these 25 new first-time mothers, 14 14 of them had follow-up babies in the following two years, so they weren't able to be retested again, but 11 of the mothers didn't, and so they looked at these mothers with MRI scans two years later, and they found that indeed, in most cases, these gray matter changes remained. The one area of the brain where that didn't hold true was the hippocampus, so the memory area seemed to bounce back, but the changes in the social interaction areas seemed like they held strong. And the changes were so consistent that a computer algorithm was able to predict with 100% accuracy which of the women had been pregnant just by looking at the MRI scan results. The scientists are interested now in doing follow-up on studies on adoptive mothers and also on mothers who put their own children up for adoption. So looking at both sides of those coins, which of these changes might be 
stimulated by the pregnancy itself and which might be stimulated by the interaction with the child or some of the predictable results of having a new baby like disrupted sleep and things like that. Of course, because brain changes were not seen in the new fathers to any significant degree, it's likely that the hormonal changes involved with pregnancy itself play a major role, says evolutionary psychologist Mel Rutherford. This study opens the door to the possibility that the brain changes seen in parenting might have implications for decision-making and behavior later in life. So just one more factor to consider when you're wondering when or if to start a family. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews on iTunes. Listener Silvertip Sun from Canada says, Maybe it's a placebo or the side effect of bringing attention to my wandering attention, but I feel smarter and energized if I start the day with one of these podcasts. And Kratom Cured from the USA, Kratom you may remember was last week's episode topic, says, This is a podcast everyone should listen to. It works hard to teach about cognitive functions and life in general. Well, thanks to both of you and thanks to everyone that's been leaving positive reviews or spreading the word in whatever way you choose to do so. All of that is super helpful. Pick a social media platform of your choice and evangelize in whatever way you see fit. You will certainly have our thanks. And no, that's not me talking in the royal we. That's kind of me talking on behalf of the Smart Drug Smarts team. Another part of the we is the folks over at axonlabs.io where we've got a couple of supplement stacks. Nexus, our cognitive stack, and Mitogen, a mitochondrial enhancer. Or maybe I should say a mitochondrial feeder and proliferator since that's really what it's doing. It helps to build additional mitochondria that you don't have already and keep the ones that you have well stocked with the biological building blocks they need to do their work. Neither of those are actually in my system right now. Today's going to be a fasting day for me. Every now and then I'll do that. I'll throw in an absolutely nothing day, including no food. And today is when my lots come up. I'm definitely a believer in mixing things up a little, keeping your body off balance. This is the idea of hormesis. We had a great hormesis episode probably about a year ago. I would recommend jumping back and checking that one out if you missed it. So yeah, no nexus, no mitogen for me, but that same prohibition does not apply to you. If you want to try either of those out, you can find both of those online over at axonlabs.io or if you're loitering around the Smart Drug Smarts website, We've got a shop link there that'll take you right over. Also on smartdrugsmarts.com, it is not hard to find sign-up points for our newsletter called The Brain Breakfast. If you're not on our mailing list yet, we send out emails every eh, 7 to 14 days. It's a less than rigorous publication schedule we have there, as opposed to the podcast itself, where we are diligent about getting it out every Friday. But you'd have the second part of a two-parter coming at you soon, should you be signed up for that newsletter. Easiest way to get that is just to type in smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. You type in one field, click one button, and you're pretty much there. Been start to get some emails from people wondering if I'm going to be doing another seven-day water fast and when that's going to happen. The answer is yes, it is a new calendar year. My plan is to do that at least once a year. It's now 2017, so it's a legitimate question. Probably going to wait till it's a bit later in the year. A little bit warmer for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, mainly because I think that the self-deprivation of not getting any food need not be compounded with the deprivation of having less than glorious weather outside. So stay tuned on that. But yeah, when I peg that to a date, I'll definitely let everybody know. Should you wish to join in, we will do an online community thing as we've done in past years, which is a lot of fun and definitely makes it easier to stick with having some online compatriots. But that is all for now. So let's move ahead to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Dr. Chris Masterjohn, who is a dedicated researcher and educator about fats, dietary fats, fatty acids, their biological precursors, how they work within the body, why we should care, how they could help, why people might be too afraid of them, and trying to do as much myth busting and dissemination of information as one person possibly can. And he's making a pretty large dent. He's got a podcast called The Daily Lipid. He also has very active YouTube and Facebook channels where he expounds on biological systems, particularly dealing with fat metabolism and where he thinks conventional health recommendations might really be getting things wrong. So we're going to be talking a bunch in this conversation about arachidonic acid, probably the principal omega-6 fatty acid. Omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids are the kinds spoken about most commonly. Oftentimes, omega-3s are the ones you hear about more in relation to the brain. And we've done at least three episodes dealing with omega-3 fatty acids or fish oils and seafoods, which which often amounts to the same thing. And this is really our first one talking about omega-6s in specific. So I'll put my hand up as a guilty party for not giving omega-6s their fair share of spotlight and attention and until now, but omega-6s are often the victims of bad press. Diets with a preponderance of omega-6s versus omega-3s can be bad for some reasons, which we'll hear about in the coming interview, but also that if you're getting a diet with a proper mix of real foods, it might not be as much of a concern what that actual ratio is. One terminology bomb that gets dropped is something called a TPN or total parenteral nutrition, which we talk about maybe halfway into the interview. What TPN is, is something that's used in hospitals sometimes when a person can't be fed directly and they need to get food intravenously. So it basically describes the nutritional mix, which is getting piped straight into the bloodstream, bypassing the digestive tract. So when you hear total parenteral nutrition or TPN in this interview, that's what we're talking about. And now with no further preamble, Dr. Chris Masterjohn. 
I had been interested in nutrition going back to my teenage years, especially since I grew up with my mom having a lot of health problems that she solved by making a lot of changes in her diet and really getting very interested in alternative health and so on. But that also <laughs> led me down not the greatest path in the world because I didn't really have a strong foundation in nutrition science. And, you know, if you look at the alternative health world, less so now, although it's I think it's still very strong, but this was especially true when I was a teenager that the alternative health world was very dominated by vegetarianism and veganism and also mainstream ideas about fat. So I became a vegetarian and soon after that a vegan during my late teens. And I really experienced a massive aggravation of anxiety disorders that I had had as a teenager to the point where they had really become something that was interfering with my basic functioning. I would say I suffered from regular panic attacks. I suffered from OCD. And I had no reason to connect this to my diet at the time. And my way out of this was not so much to try to fix my mental health at all. It was actually to fix my teeth because I had gone to a dentist and found that I had over a dozen cavities and needed two root canals. This is in one visit. Wow. And I had always been vulnerable to tooth decay as a child as well, but I had never experienced anywhere near this rate of tooth decay. This was mind blowing. And fortuitously, around the same time as I was an undergraduate in college working in a dining hall for some extra money, my boss and now friend Wayne gave me a pamphlet. The pamphlet was actually produced by a, a local farm who was selling raw milk, but it discussed the work of Weston Price, who was, I think, looking back, I would say one of the pioneers of nutritional anthropology. And he was a dentist by trade and had spent 25 years directing what became the American Dental Association's Research Institute, trying to understand the causes and consequences of tooth decay. And he was ultimately compelled to travel around the world to many different continents, looking for people who were isolated from modern society and were free of tooth decay. And what he found was that in many areas, at different latitudes, different climates, different people with different genetics and cultural heritage, there was a consistent trend of the nutritional transition from traditional diets to diets that were rich in what he called displacing foods of modern commerce. So the white foods, white rice, white sugar, white flour, canned goods, syrups, jams, things like that. Yeah. And what was remarkable about his research was that the people eating their traditional diets were consistently emphasizing the importance of certain animal foods that Price identified as rich sources of fat-soluble vitamins. And although the many different traditional diets were each unique in their own way, he basically identified four categories, at least one of which were not only used, but highly prized and sought out by these communities. And those included shellfish or the other animal life of the sea. They included organ meats and egg yolks. They included dairy products and they included small animals like insects and small frogs and so on. I was fascinated by this concept of immunity to tooth decay. And so I immediately see this idea and I'm like, hey, I want in on that. This is my main problem here. So I started intensively incorporating the principles that I learned from Weston Price's work. And what totally surprised me was the effect that this had on my mental health. Price did write about mental health to a limited degree in his book. And so it was something that was there, but it wasn't the main thrust of the book by any stretch of the imagination. And it wasn't anything that was anywhere near the forefront in my mind that might have been helped by these dietary changes. And the key defining moment for me was several months after I started making these changes, I was working in the dining hall at UMass Amherst, which is where I did my undergraduate degree. And I saw someone pick up a stack of plates and choose the plate from down in the middle. And I gave him a funny look and I scratched my head and I said, what the heck is that guy doing? Oh no. I was always doing that a few months before. And not only that, but I was engaging in far worse behaviors than that, I would sometimes spend 15 or 20 minutes looking for a glass out of the clean glasses that was clean enough for me to drink out of Wow! and things like that. So the change was so intense that I had completely forgotten these sets of behaviors, you know, and mental frameworks that had been a central part of my life just a few months before. And I had to see it in someone else and see that as something foreign to me to realize how much I had changed at that point. We've had prior episodes of this 
this show where one of the main drum beats that have been hit by the experts being interviewed has been this skewed ratio between omega-6s and omega-3s and sort of the standard American diet, which most people are getting too much in the way of omega-6s, as it was explained. You've written a lot in defense of arachidonic acid, which is sort of the primary of the omega-6s. Can you talk about some of the finer points there, maybe splice those terms a bit? Sure. So if you look at the fatty acids that dominate cell membranes in the body, the principal omega-6 fatty acid that you would find in the membrane phospholipids is arachidonic acid. And the principal omega-3 fatty acid that you would find is docosahexaenoic acid or DHA. And arachidonic acid, there's two ways to get it. One is to eat it directly in the diet and the other is to convert it from the omega-6 precursor in plant oils, which is linoleic acid. And DHA, you can also get it in the diet and you can also convert it from the omega-3 precursor in plant oils, which is alpha linolenic acid. There's also another omega-3 fatty acid that's been interest to people, which is EPA. And EPA is an intermediate in the synthesis of DHA from the precursors in plant oils. And you also can eat EPA directly in the diet, particularly in fish. If you look in the cell membrane phospholipids of humans and other animals, however, EPA tends to be a minor fatty acid, especially outside the context of consuming large amounts of fish or marine oils. And that's more true in the tissues that are more highly regulated. For example, the nervous system's fatty acids are more strongly regulated and conserved than many of the other membranes outside the nervous system. And when you look there, it is especially true that the predominant omega-6 fatty acid is arachidonic acid and that overwhelmingly the predominant omega-3 fatty acid is DHA. It's not to say that small amounts of EPA aren't important in the nervous system and that can be discussed and debated, but when you look at what is the major fatty acid that's present in those membranes, it's definitely those two. And as far as the bioavailability of each of these, we tend to have an easier time absorbing them from animal sources than from plant sources as a general rule, correct? I think if you change the word absorb to utilize or something of that nature, I think I would tweak it in that way and that would become a pretty accurate statement. So I think the bottleneck in the process of obtaining arachidonic acid and DHA from plant oils is the ability to convert the precursors into the final form that is most physiologically essential in our membranes. And there are a few reasons for that, some of which are potentially under our control and some of which aren't. So one of the influences is the existence of genetic polymorphisms in the enzymes that make those conversions. And there's not a lot of research on this, but there's enough to say that there's a lot of genetic variation between different people. So if you're insulin resistant, then you are going to be proportionally less good at making the conversion from the plant oils to the final form. And conversely, if you are not stimulating insulin, you are also not going to be very good at making that conversion. So if you look at the popular ideas in the low carbohydrate community, that the key to maximizing insulin sensitivity is to not stimulate insulin very much by not eating very much carbohydrate. That may be helpful, especially in the case where it's causing weight loss. But if you are maximally sensitizing yourself to a hormone that you're never stimulating, you're still not getting the downstream insulin signaling. So I would say the happy balance in terms of promoting that conversion is finding the sweet spot where you are becoming maximally sensitive to insulin. The sweet but not too sweet spot. Yeah, in my evidence-based opinion. I think that at the end of the day, you want to be sensitive to insulin, but you also want to be consuming an adequate amount of carbohydrate to actually get significant insulin signaling. And so I think that's within the realm of what your body can use each day. And I think for the average person, that's going to be at least a couple hundred grams of carbohydrate to get robust insulin signaling. And that's going to be one of the important things in that conversion. Yeah, another Goldilocks sort of situation where you don't want to have too much or too little in the way of carbohydrates. There are also some nutrients that are important. Uh, among the principal ones, I would list vitamin B6, vitamin A, and there are a few others. And the principal signs of a deficiency are problems with the skin, hair, and nails, but also problems like depression and other issues in the nervous system. And at least part of that is probably mediated by not having these fatty acids that we're talking about. But in any case, if we sort of go back to the big picture here, what we're seeing is that there's a lot of different things, some of which are under your control, some of which are not so much under your control, that are affecting whether you are good at making the conversion from the omega-3 and omega-6 
omega-6 fatty acids in plant oils to the ones that are found in animal foods and the ones that are needed in our tissues. And I think that when you're dealing with that level of uncertainty, instead of trying to micromanage it, the average person is in a much better position to simply consume some of the animal foods that are rich in those fatty acids so that you don't have to worry about whether you're making those conversions properly because it's incredibly cumbersome and time and labor intensive to try to characterize your genome and measure your vitamin B6 status and you know track all the micronutrients in your foods. There's certainly some highly motivated people who will do all of those things, but it's a much more robust approach to simply include the animal foods in the diet that supply those fatty acids and make that system redundant. So yes, you want to eat a nutritious diet that contains all those nutrients. Yes, you want to be sensitive to insulin, but you don't want to have any small problem within that spectrum of important things going wrong to impact your ability to get those fatty acids into your nervous system and into the rest of your cell membranes. So in that context, I would say that liver and egg yolks are overwhelmingly the best sources of arachidonic acid. And for DHA, I think this is much more well-known, but fatty seafood is the best source of the omega-3 fatty acids. And there are also small amounts of DHA that you would obtain from animals raised on pasture. So for example, if you take the egg yolk of a chicken that's been raised on pasture, it's going to have significant amounts of arachidonic acid and DHA as well. DHA won't be as rich in that chicken egg yolk as it would be in, say, a salmon filet, but it would be meaningful. And in this standard modern diet, we do tend to be very low on the omega-3 fatty acids. And that's because if we're not eating seafood, all of our animal foods have shifted from pasture-raised animal foods to confinement-raised animal foods where they are consuming corn and soybeans and other grain foods that are lower in omega-3 fatty acids. And also the proportion of omega-6 rich plant oils in our diet has at the same time dramatically increased. But if you take a sort of broad perspective of the essential fatty acid research that's been done over the last century, from 1929 through the 1970s, the only well-established and recognized essential fatty acid was the omega-6 branch of those fatty acids. And it was linoleic acid from plant oils that was and is called the essential fatty acid, but through that history was attributed to its conversion to arachidonic acid. And all of the clinical signs that were associated with essential fatty acid deficiency were seen as physiological deficiencies of arachidonic acid in cell membranes. And a lot of time now when we think about cell membranes and neurons, we're thinking about omega-3s and myelination, things like that. In the 1970s, there were patients fed total parenteral nutrition who were getting eczema. And some of the leaders in the essential fatty acid community argued that that eczema was because the TPN did not contain any fatty acids. So they started adding vegetable oils to the TPN. And there were two versions. One was was made with soybean oil, which isn't the ideal oil from my perspective, but is pretty well balanced between omega-3 and omega-6s. And the other one was safflower oil, which has an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of, if I remember right, 140 to 1. Oh, wow. And there was a girl who had an abdominal gunshot wound and she was on TPN for six months and she was given the formula that had the safflower oil. And she developed all kinds of neurological problems where she had peripheral neuropathy, tingling in her hands and feet, double vision, confusion, on down the list, you know, massively interruptive neurological conditions signaling an emergency. And they fixed this simply by taking her off of the safflower TPN and putting her on the soybean oil TPN. This was really the turning point in essential fatty acid research where people started saying, hey, you know what? Yes, some people have been saying this for decades, but now we finally see actual evidence that omega-3 fatty acids are required in humans. But it still took decades for this to leak into the textbooks. I have a biochemistry textbook from about 10 years ago that didn't even discuss the essentiality of omega-3 fatty acids and said that the principal required fatty acid in the body is arachidonic acid. And so what happened was that eventually the idea first caught on in the alternative health community driven by specific school 
of researchers who were looking at the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. And then it started to become pretty mainstream. But it got to the point where the pendulum swung so far in favor of omega-3 fatty acids being the darling fatty acids that everyone's just sort of forgot the first 60 years of essential fatty acid research that right. looked at how important arachidonic acid is. And if you look at the experiments that followed up the incident with the abdominal gunshot wound, these experiments looked at what could have been going wrong in the brain in that case. And what they found was that if you have a diet that doesn't have the preformed arachidonic acid or DHA in it, you are entirely reliant on the enzymatic system that converts the precursors in plant oils. But that enzymatic system is the exact same enzymes are responsible both for converting the omega-6 fatty acids in plant oils to arachidonic acid and to converting the omega-3 fatty acids in plant oils to DHA. And so if you are completely relying on that enzymatic system, you become very sensitive to changes in the ratios of those precursors. Because if you have 10 times as much omega-6 precursor as omega-3 precursor, then you know you have a common pool of those fatty acids that are being metabolized by that enzyme. Those enzymes are preferentially utilized the omega-6 fatty acids. So if you're faced with a 10 to 1 ratio, then what actually goes through that synthetic pathway because the key enzymes have greater affinity for the omega-6 fatty acid is actually in far greater excess of 10 to 1 in favor of the omega-6 fatty acids. So in that case, what winds up happening is all of the slots in the brain and the rest of the nervous system, all of the slots in the membranes that are meant to have DHA in them will instead get filled up with a 22 carbon omega-6 fatty acid that in every respect looks just like DHA, including its carbon length, which is 22 carbons. But the number of double bonds that they have and the position that they have make it an omega-6 fatty acid called DPA. And this particular fatty acid is not normally present in the brain in any meaningful quantity. And so if you are not consuming DHA in the diet and you have this massive excess of omega-6 plant oils, you don't actually get more arachidonic acid in the brain. What you get is the replacement of DHA with this imposter omega-6 DPA fatty acid. And and the problems that result from that aren't from too much arachidonic acid because you don't have too much arachidonic acid. The problems are from not having the DHA in the brain. But you have to take a step back and say, what would happen in those experiments if there were fatty fish and pastured egg yolks in the diet? Or what would have happened to the girl with the abdominal gunshot wound had she been not on TPN and instead been on a mixed diet, including fatty fish and pastured egg yolks, but also having safflower oil the diet? Or what would have happened if the TPN contained, in addition to safflower oil, a small amount of DHA in the TPN? Based on what I've seen in all the studies that I've looked at, I suspect that what would happen in those conditions is that the effect of the safflower oil would be massively blunted because the nervous system would choose to take the DHA available and put it where it belongs. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it's harmless to consume large amounts of safflower oil. There are plenty of other reasons not to consume large amounts of safflower oil. But the really key driving factor here that you need to be concerned with is getting the DHA into the nervous system. And it's less about the ratio of fatty acids in the diet because you're maximally sensitive to that ratio only when you're not consuming the preformed fatty acids in the diet. And that's true of all of the animal research that was used to justify specific ratios of omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. All of that research was conducted in the context of using the plant oils as the sole source of essential fatty acids. And that is the one context where it becomes maximally relevant. But if you look at humans eating mixed diets, the one context that actually replicates or approximates that experimental scenario is in the context of a vegan whole foods diet. And so I would say, yeah, for a vegan who's not supplementing with a source of DHA, then yes, it becomes very critical to manage that ratio. But I think for someone who's eating animal foods, you still don't want to be consuming these omega-6 rich plant oils, but the highest priority is actually getting all the preformed fatty acids, both omega-6 and omega-3. So I think yeah. the key foods that you're looking at there are liver, pastured egg yolks, and some fatty fish in the diet. And if you're covering those bases, I think you're doing really well. 
You've written a lot about mental health, making sure that our dopamine systems and our levels of endocannabinoids are supported by our diets, getting enough arachidonic acid, vitamins A and D, I remember, were important also. Maybe if you can cover some of that ground. Sure. So I think if you start with dopamine, I think there was a period of time where we saw dopamine as a pleasure chemical. And so that would be the basis for saying when you use recreational drugs, you're getting a dopamine burst. And when you eat sugar, you're getting a dopamine burst. And when you have sex, you're getting a dopamine burst. And, you know, all these things are highly pleasurable things. But I think as time has gone on, we're starting to instead see dopamine as more of a motivational chemical such that if you want to have sustained goal oriented behavior, then you need to have adequate dopamine signaling. And one of the areas in which I had researched how the fat soluble vitamins interplay with this is in the case of the endocannabinoid. And these are named after cannabis. And that's because the active chemical THC binds to the same receptors, but the endocannabinoids are produced endogenously. So the name is similar to how endorphins was derived from morphine and heroin being, you know, the endogenous chemicals that are interacting in that network. And I was first inspired to look at this because when I was in graduate school, one of my professors in the nutrition department was on the committee of a PhD student in the psychology department. And he got me to go to this person's doctoral dissertation. And it was all about how blocking the endocannabinoid system could totally demolish the dopamine response to a particular stimulus in an animal. This became very interesting to me because at the time I was trying to find ways that the fat-soluble vitamins connect to mental health. And so one of the questions that I asked was, okay, do the fat-soluble vitamins play into this endocannabinoid system? or into this dopamine system. And so it turns out that vitamin A is very important for regulating the expression of dopamine receptors. And arachidonic acid is the direct precursor to the endocannabinoids that activate the endocannabinoid receptors and thereby contribute to dopamine signaling. And if you just take vitamin A and arachidonic acid, everything that we said before about the ability to convert fatty acids and plant oils to arachidonic acid is very analogous to the ability to convert carotenoids in plant foods to the physiologically essential form of vitamin A, which is retinol. And if you look at what is the best source of retinol, once again, you see liver, which is also one of the two best sources of arachidonic acid. And you also see smaller amounts of vitamin A in other fatty animal foods like egg yolks, for example. And so you start to see a pattern here where these nutrient-dense animal foods like liver and egg yolks popping up over and over again here. The article that you referenced that I had written about also refers to some roles for vitamin D and calcium in this system because if you have very poor vitamin D status and you have calcium levels sinking in the brain or you have some misregulation of management of where calcium is going, which could also be related to having adequate magnesium in the diet or an adequate metabolic rate, then that can also compromise how the system is activated. But the raw material for this system is arachidonic acid. And I think if you look at how how has our diets changed over the last half century or so? I think it's definitely true that arachidonic acid levels in the diet have dramatically declined. And it's definitely true that vitamin A, at least in the sense of the animal form, retinol, has definitely declined in the diet because cod liver oil use has been abandoned and liver consumption has been abandoned. And we have for decades labored under the assumption that egg yolks have too much cholesterol in them to consume regularly and will contribute to heart disease. So I think across the board in the modern population, retinol intakes have dramatically declined over the last half century. But in the health conscious community, I think that even more so than elsewhere, we've seen even egg yolks start to really take a toll in terms of what people are consuming. And I think that moving away from omega-6 rich plant oils towards more omega-3 balanced plant oils is probably a good thing mm -hmm. on the whole. But in the context of a diet that's devoid of liver cod liver oil, egg yolks, and so on and so forth, maybe has some fatty fish in it. I think there's a meaningful concern about not getting enough arachidonic acid into the tissues. And when you throw on top of that, that the most commonly used drugs over the counter are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs whose specific motivation
mode of action is to target the enzymes that interfere with arachidonic acid signaling, then I think that altogether we have sort of a recipe for swinging the pendulum way to the side of getting inadequate arachidonic acid levels in the tissues and also inadequate downstream metabolism of arachidonic acid. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Dr. Chris Masterjohn for taking the time for that conversation. As mentioned, Dr. Masterjohn is very, very present online. In the show notes for this episode, we'll have links to a lot of places where you can find him, including his YouTube channel, Facebook page, etc., etc. His name is also spelled just like it sounds, so not hard to punch up. But we'll give you all the links at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 166. I thought there were some really excellent points there about how a person might get their diet perfect by micromanaging everything that they're putting into themselves. If you perfectly measure everything, pay attention, know a lot of things about your own personal microbiome and your genetics and this and that. Or possibly you could save yourself a lot of trouble, probably a lot of investigation and maybe a PhD or two just by making sure that you're occasionally getting food from some traditional food categories, things like the shellfish, organ meats, dairy products, and small animals mentioned by Dr. Master John, things that almost every traditional diet dipped into at least one or two of those categories. If you are a hardcore vegan for any reason, you probably have to watch your ratio of omega-3s and omega-6s a lot more carefully than everybody else. But if you've got a little bit more latitude in your diet, just double underline on your shopping list liver, egg yolks from pasture-raised chickens, and fatty seafoods. But moving on now from fatty foods to constrictive neckties, let's scoot ahead to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So if you're thinking about the animal kingdom and concussions, which you might not be, but if you were, you might think about rams ramming their head together and how that's going to probably do quite a bit of shaking to the brain. You might also think about the woodpecker, an animal that bangs its head into trees for a living. And inventor David Smith was thinking about woodpeckers, rattling their brains by using their beaks as chisels. But a little known trick is that woodpeckers use their tongues to constrict their own jugular veins and thereby apparently protect themselves from brain injury and could this possibly be applied to humans? So what happens when a person or a woodpecker or an animal gets a concussion is essentially that the brain is rattling around on the inside of the skull. There's a little bit of a fluid layer there between the brain and the inner wall of the skull, which normally is a good thing. But in the event of a sudden jolt, the brain's momentum can force that liquid out of the way and hit the inner wall of the skull, maybe bounce back and forth a couple of times. This is how the damage happens and it's not a good thing. Now what woodpeckers do when they constrict their jugular vein is essentially put a kink in the hose that gets the blood out of the brain. This increases is the overall liquid pressure inside the skull makes everything a little bit tighter packed in this overall increased pressure when there's an impact like a woodpecker banging on a log it keeps the brain from being able to rattle as much if you think about a seatbelt in a car it's like having a tight seatbelt versus a loose seatbelt the brain is held in position better and has less wiggle room to bang around and get injured so dr gregory meyer from the cincinnati children's hospital medical center along with david smith had the idea of seeing if something similar could work with humans constricting the jugular vein increasing the pressure in the skull and thereby protecting humans from concussions, at least partially. So they built a protective collar that does just that. It's tight around the neck, and they ran a trial on 14 male high school hockey players, the results of which were presented last year at the American College of Sports Medicine 2016 annual meeting. And the results were pretty good. The players' brains were assessed before and during the middle of hockey season, and any impact on a player's brain during play was measured with an accelerometer. Head impacts were similar between the two groups that were and weren't wearing the collars, and wearing the collars didn't seem to affect the play of the players, although they wanted to do a mid-season switchover and have the people who weren't wearing them wear them during the second half of the season and vice versa, but the people who hadn't been wearing them, only four of them were willing to do the trade, so they didn't wind up doing that second part of the study. However, the study did find that the diffusion tensor measures of disruption to the white matter of the brain did increase significantly in the players who did not wear the collars. And then correspondingly, they saw a significant correlation between changes in white matter and changes in brain network activation, which presumably is not a good thing, because likewise, there was a high correlation between boys who experienced more head impacts and boys who had the greater changes in brain network activation. So these changes were not the kind of changes you wanted to see, and the collars did seem to significantly reduce them. A larger study is now taking place with 62 football players. It is worth mentioning that this study was funded by people who are trying to commercialize this collar, so bear that with whatever grain of salt seems relevant. But nevertheless, an interesting idea, a woodpecker-derived technology to protect the brain by restricting blood flow out of the head. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. 
Okay, so that's it for episode number 166. Thank you for having hung around until the very end. Everything you could possibly want to know about this episode insofar as links and things of that nature can be found online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 166. If you missed last week's episode, we talked about a compound called Kratom with Dr. Alicia Lidecker. And next week, we're going to be talking about passion flower and probably a couple of other plant compounds as well. So on a somewhat botanical streak, or at least bookending today's episode with a couple of botanical episodes, probably getting to some more strictly pharmaceutical stuff later in the the month of February. February, by the way, is apparently National Heart Month, at least in America. This is relevant to us because heart health is brain health, as it was famously said by Dr. Sandra Bond Chapman from the Center for Brain Health. Basically, anything you can do to increase or maintain your heart and circulatory health is going to have knock-on positive effects for your neurological health. So you can kind of put an asterisk next to February and think of it as a brain health month as well. In any case, I will be back at you next Friday, same time, same podcast, and with the same ongoing commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.